Making champagne is a long process. It's possibly one of the longest processes in winemaking because you basically make two wines. This accounts both for champagne and great champagne. First produce a basic white wine, which is a little bit lower in alcohol than normally. So you harvest it a little bit before and you want it to be extremely acid. So therefore you always also harvest it before. So you basically harvest the unripe white wine. It tastes awful. It doesn't taste good at all. This is the really difficult part of champagne because you have to have an imaginary sense of how that thing is going to be able to taste 10 or 15 years down the road, having put it through a second fermentation. This is the masterwork of a champagne blender, is blending these wines because you don't only have one wine. From different corners of the vineyards, even from different vineyards, we have three small plots put together as one, but we use a little bit from that corner. And here we can speak about 5% from here, 2% from there, 60% from here, and it all does make a difference. So you blend a base wine, we call it, white wine, and it still tastes awful, no matter how much you blend it. Put that into a bottle, be it a magnum or a normal bottle, or even a larger bottle, and then you add, because you need it to have bubbles in there, and we want the bubbles to be natural. So what you do is you add some yeast, and something sweet, sugar, that the yeast can live from. So there is a difference as to the sweetened thing, the sweet thing you put in there, and that comes with the great champagne. Most champagne companies, normal champagne, would just use normal white sugar. So then you close the bottle, add yeast and you add sugar in a very, very, very specific proportion, because too much sugar, you're gonna have technical problems. Too little sugar, too little bubbles. Because what happens? So when you then close the bottle, you don't close it with a champagne cork, as we know it. You actually put a capsule on. And then you leave the bottle there. Then the yeast starts eating all of the sugar. And when it does that, it produces two things from that process. It produces heat and CO2. So as most of the old cellars in champagne are underground, and they're really cold, the heat is not a problem. Huh? So the heat is just disappearing. And all of the CO2 is kept within the bottle. That's where the bubbles come from. So now, when there's no more sugar left, um, the yeast cells die. They fall to the bottom of the bottle and they start decomposing. And the longer they get to do this, it's a very specific pro process in making great champagne. So the longer they get to stay there, the more complexity do we get into a champagne. The more of the biscuit flavors, the more of the toasty flavors, the more of, of everything more than just the fruit. That comes by aging over time on the lease in the bottle. You have to get that out. And if you start filtering the wine, you're gonna lose the bubbles and you're gonna lose a lot of other things. You don't wanna do that either. So back in the very old history of champagne, somebody invented a method of getting that out, all natural. So what you do is that you begin with the bottle, completely horizontal. And then over a period of around 30 days, each day, you lift it 30% and you twist it 30%. You, it's called riddling, remouage in French. You keep doing that and the decomposed yeast slowly moves down the inside of the bottle until it's in the bottleneck. Inside of that small capsule is a small plastic cup that sort of captures all of this. So when the bottle is finally standing upside down, all of this is done by hand. And you do it each day, it's a, it's a lot of work. Traditionally, for most other champagnes. What is done is that you submerge the lowest part of the bottleneck into an undercooled water mixture with salt and water. So you freeze the neck of the bottle with all of the dirt inside and a small part of the champagne. Turn the champagne around and you shoot that out like you would with a normal cork. Now, this is a bit of a violent process, we believe, because we don't want to freeze some part of our champagne, and no, it's just not the philosophy of Ballancroft. So what we do instead is that we do exactly the same thing until it stands on the top. And we take each bottle hand by hand, open them up like this, and then swing them around very quickly. So we shoot out all of the dirt, but without having it frozen. We lose a little bit more champagne this way, but we prevent violating, as we call it, the bottle by freezing a part of it. 
Yeah, so when we use sugar, we actually don't use sugar. Um, this is something fantastic about Roland Croft. Um, because you actually use sugar twice in the production of champagne. You use it when you want to make the bubbles. You also add a little bit of sugar before you put the cork in, because at that time the wine is completely dry. So most of us buy a bottle of champagne that says put on. We think it's dry because it tastes dry, but it's actually added a little bit of sugar. Technically, you can have up to 15 grams of residual sugar in total per liter. Now oh, that's really geeky. But Brut Champagne has always a little bit of sugar added. So whenever we add sugar in Berlin Croft, it's not sugar. It's old grape juice from the same vineyards that have been aged and stored for in between 15 to 65 years. Now the reason for doing this is that you imagine this is basically grape syrup that has been aged in oak barrels. So it gives a very particular authentic taste of sweetness, which is just not white sugar, it's just white sugar. Here we add some of the aging potential from that particular vineyard into our wines. It adds a whole different layer of complexity. You're speaking about tiny, tiny, you're speaking about adding four grams into a liter and you can still taste it. And it comes from the very same piece of land. And nobody else does that.